Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 5. Our scripture reading for today is Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And that passage can be found in your pew Bibles on page 942. Page 942, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Dear ones, let us pray. Our Father, we bless you for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whom we hope. We thank you for your holy word, which reveals him to us, and your spirit, which brings him to us and us to him. I pray today for the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit by the word of God in our midst that cannot be manufactured by mankind and cannot be imitated by any human thing. We pray that you today would build your church, that you would change us into conformity to Christ, our Father, that you'd be glorified in us and that you would fill us with the kind of hope that you want us to have and all to your glory. And we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. When it comes to receiving gifts, my dear wife loves to know what she's getting, and I would just as soon not know what I'm getting. And here's how I understand that difference between the two of us. I am more pessimistic than my wife is. I am more cynical about gifts I would say more realistic, okay, but cynical. And she's more appreciative and more optimistic. So I would just as soon not know what a gift is going to be because if I know about it for a long time, I'm going to have the opportunity to grow tired of it or bored with it. I mean, so it could be a game, it could be a shirt, it could be a toy, whatever. It's not going to keep me excited for six months waiting for it to arrive. <clears throat> Betsy is she's less cynical, she's more appreciative, she's more optimistic. She loves to know about a gift that's coming a long time in advance. And I'll tell you why, because she's gonna mull it over in her mind and she's gonna dream about it and she's gonna actually start enjoying the gift before it even comes. It could be a sweater, it could be earrings, it could be a weekend getaway. She just likes to anticipate it coming. You can ask her about that, she'll tell you. The anticipation is actually part of the fun of getting gifts for her. She's able to have joy in the gift before she has her hands on it. Uh, hoping for it to come is energizing for her. Now, the Bible teaches us as believers in Jesus Christ that we are awaiting the arrival of a promised gift from God. And unless we're cynical and pessimistic about what the Lord has promised to give us, we have the privilege both to know what the coming gift is and even to have joy on account of his gift before we have our hands on it. Today we're wrapping up our short series called Thinking About the Church. And we've thought about the church and her ordinances, her leaders, 
Her food, the word of God. Her ethic, the love of God, the love of the saints. And her worship. Today, we're going to consider the church and her hope. So what is it that the church presently hopes for? What future awaits us as believers in Jesus Christ? Do you have a coming hope that you presently enjoy? Or are you cynical and pessimistic about what is coming? Or maybe just ignorant about it. Nobody has told you what the gift is that you can hope for. The Word of God today can help you to see it. And if God is pleased, it can correct our outlook toward a proper future hope and a proper present enjoyment of the gift. If you're outside of Christ today, if that happens to be you, you're a non-participant in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then the word we're going to consider can help you come to possess the only hope that's worth having. So I commend this message to you. It's going to be good for everybody if the Lord is pleased to put it in our hearts. Now there's an outline in your bulletin that has a theme statement. I think the outline is going to be helpful for you to follow the logic of what we're saying today. The message summed up is this, the hope that belongs to Christ's church is future glory when the life of Christ will be ours to the fullest extent. So let's look at our hope together. First question on the table is what does hope even mean? To understand hope, you have to understand faith and vice versa. So I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, famous chapter on faith. And just listen to, we're, we're considering that whole chapter, we're not going to read it all. Look at the first couple of verses of Hebrews 11. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And we'll stop there. Faith is the assurance. It is the confidence. Or even better, it is the certainty of things that are hoped for. The couple of examples that are listed there, it says, by faith the people of old received their commendation from God. That means they were promised to be commended by God, to be blessed by God, to be accepted by God. And they believed that before they actually had their hands on it. And then it says, by faith we know that the whole of creation was made by the word of God out of nothing. Which means that we know that is what happened, even though we never personally saw or heard it happen. We didn't touch it, but we believe it. And the rest of the verses there, verses 4 uh, through 40, but especially 4 to 38, are just additional examples of faith, of the assurance of things not seen, the conviction of things hoped for. Faith that was exercised by people who did remarkably hard things because of something they were promised in the future. And those verses culminate. Now look at verse 39 of Hebrews 11. This is the culmination. It says, all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Now what that means is faith is responding to promise. It evokes actions from people with an assurance, with a hope that the promise is certain. It's not speculative. The promise is not contingent. And faith is hoping to the utmost. Do you see? With complete assurance. Certainty about a future occurrence that is promised is the nature of Christian hope. Nothing else 
really qualifies. And so the connection between faith and hope couldn't be tighter. They are inextricably intertwined with each other. Biblical faith only corresponds to promise. And a biblical promise is a future reality. A promise that comes from God is a future reality, not a mere possibility. It's a future reality. And hope is the awareness of that future reality. You with me? Faith, when it lays hold of God's promise in Christ, becomes certainty in that future reality before you have your hands on it. Becomes the assurance of things hoped for before you have your hands on them. It becomes the conviction of things not yet seen before you have your hands on it. So what is the Christian hope? What is the church's hope? I said it was a promise. We read these verses. Pastor Mitch just read these verses. Romans 5, 1 to 3, I want to look at again. Therefore, Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings, suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So I want you to hear what he just declared. Justified people, that's one of our $75 words, people with faith in Christ presently have peace with God. They have their hands on that. The hostility has ended. God has accepted believers in Christ. People who've been justified by faith presently have access into the condition of God's grace. All believers stand in God's grace, stand in God's favor all the time. They stand in God's favor. Now, I'm just going to pause there. I didn't get to the next piece, but I don't want to leave some of you behind and this is as good a place as any to be careful that I don't leave some of you behind. Lay some cards on the table. I just revealed something pretty profound that some of you actually need to wake up to. Believers in Christ are received as righteous by God. And they have peace with God and they stand in the condition of God's favor. And I want some of you to know that the reciprocal, the opposite of that is also true. All the people who do not have personal faith in Jesus Christ are presently held by God to be condemnably unrighteous. They have animosity with God. They stand in the wrath of God, not in his favor. If that is you, no matter how great we all think you are or how swell you think you are, God says, you are wicked, he doesn't want you to be with him, and he is angry at you. Those are the facts. And the fact is, you can't do one single thing to get yourself out of the mess that you are in. You cannot make yourself less wicked. You cannot get to God by your efforts or make God want to be with you. And you cannot turn aside his wrath. But I'm here to tell you that thanks be to God, God himself has provided the remedy for your problem. God himself sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to be the savior of the world. Jesus came as God in the flesh and he offered himself as our substitute. And on our behalf, he perfectly obeyed God. And his righteousness was approved by God. 
He merited peace with God. On our behalf, He willingly died for our sins. He offered the payment we owed. He suffered the death we deserved. He turned aside the Father's wrath by having the Father's wrath fully rest on Him for us. So Jesus is the one and only way to God. He's the path to peace with God. He is the offer of the grace of God. So I call upon you, if you're outside of Christ today, to call upon him. You can be forgiven of your sins. You can be accepted by God as righteous. You can have peace with God. You can stand in the grace of God with all his children if you believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Turn from your sins and put your faith in Jesus. And then it will at once be said of you that you've been justified by faith. And you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So I call on you to come to Christ by faith alone. Now, if you do that, then it will also be said of you what the passage goes on to say. That you rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Because this is where our message goes, right out of Romans 5. This saving faith carries with it the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in that. But what does that mean? What does the hope of the glory of God mean? It is the hope that consists of God's glory. Specifically, The hope of a full display of God's glory, which is the sum of who he is. It's his character revealed. Shared with his people who are in Christ. It means Christians being glorified in the way that creatures can be glorified. That's what it means. The hope of the glory of God. Is God's glory shared with the human creature, the believer? We don't just hope that God will be glorified, but specifically that he will be glorified in us. And therefore, we hope that we will be glorified. Do you see how that works? To hope in God's glory is to hope in God's glory in us. All people with faith in Christ, are possessors of the hope of being glorified as creatures with the glory of God. That's a big deal. To put another name on that, the glory of God in which we hope is for us to be bodily resurrected and changed and to receive a new creation body exactly like Jesus' own new creation body. The hope of the glory of God is the hope of being just like Jesus in his glorified humanity. You know the Bible talks all the time about Christians having Christ-likeness, but I'm wanting you to see that this is a promise that you are supposed to believe. It is something that you are supposed to know for sure. It is your hope. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, there are several parts to that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 reminds us that it includes the present transformation that's taking place. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it's in your outline. Don't turn there. But it says, we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image From one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So he says the Christian life is summed up as a life of looking to Christ while he changes you gradually to be as glorious as he is in his humanity. And of course, resurrection is the end game of that. So it culminates in the resurrection. It climaxes in the resurrection. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 49 says. It says, just as we have borne 
the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. That's talking about bodily resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. So in the resurrection, that change process is brought to its finality, its conclusion. We used to be like fallen Adam, and finally, in the resurrection, we bear the image of Jesus Christ, the man of heaven. That's why Philippians chapter 3 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior <clears throat> who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. That's the final piece of our transformation from one degree of glory to another, bodily resurrection. And, of course, that state is going to persist in the eternal enjoyment of God's presence. We're not going to turn to Revelation 22, but it describes the final state, chapter 22, and really uh, chapter 21 and 22, <coughs> describes that final glorified state. It describes us worshiping him and living in his light and reigning with him forever and ever. We enjoy him forever. We share his glory forever. All of this is what God has said is going to happen for us. That has the weight of a divine promise. It is the certainty of the divine word. And so that hope is not wishfulness. It is certainty. That's something I want you to grasp. You're used to thinking about hope in terms of wishfulness. I'm not going to argue with Webster <clears throat> about all the ways somebody might use the word hope, but humans tend to use the word hope to mean wishfulness about possible outcomes. Sometimes it's about impossible outcomes. People call hope the desire for a certain future, but not one that's backed by a promise. Yeah, I hope my kid gets a job. I doubt it. <laughs> I hope my test comes back negative. I hope our event doesn't get canceled because of weather. That's all just wishful thinking. I'm not saying it's sin to want those things, but hope is certainty Biblical hope, Christian hope, gospel hope is certainty in a promised future. It's of a different character. So that's why I put the definition right in your bulletin. Christian hope, which cannot disappoint, is the certainty of God's promise of glory laid hold of by faith and sustained by God's presence. It's the certainty, because Hebrew says it's the assurance of things hoped for. And it's God's promise of glory. We hope in the glory of God. It's laid hold of by faith, and it's sustained by the God who has poured out his love in our hearts. And the Bible says right there in Romans 5 that this hope does not put us to shame. I like the New American Standard Translation, it does not disappoint. But now you know, misplaced faith, wrong hopes, less sure hopes can bring all kinds of disappointment. And that's some of your problem. You're living with a lot of disappointment because you put your hope in a lot of stuff you never should put your hope in. Stop hoping in things that are not promised. Those things will disappoint you. Stop saying that you're believing God for things that God has not promised you. Stop it. If you believe God for his promises, you will never be disappointed. But if you impose your own promises upon God and then believe those, you will be disappointed. You cannot put God's name on your words and turn them into God's words. So believe God's word of promise and you will have a hope that is sure. Namely, the hope of the glory of God that starts now and culminates in the new creation and lasts forever. 
Now, what's it like to hope that way? That's a big deal, hope. What's it like to have that? Well, it, the Bible says we rejoice in hope of the glory of God, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, and the Bible will make it plain, that that needs some explaining. It's not as simplistic as saying we, we rejoice so we're just happy all the time. It's a little more complicated than that. The experience of hope is longing for future glory. Let's look at it realistically. Turn over to Romans chapter 8. A definitive passage in many ways on this. Pick it up in verse 18. Let's read a few together. The Apostle Paul writes, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So just pause there. We'll pick it up again in a minute. This present time that Romans 5 says is a time of rejoicing in hope. It is a time of suffering. But what he says is the suffering is insignificant when it's compared to the coming glory. That's what verse 18 said. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory. So, is that rejoicing? Yeah. Because the suffering's not worth comparing with what's coming. Now, it says here that the whole creation is itself longing for God's glory in us to come. You know, the entire cosmos was long ago subjected to a curse of futility. I'm talking about the whole non-rational creation. Everything that is. It was subjected to a curse because of man's fall into sin. A curse of, it, it's called here futility, which means everything dies and wears out and breaks down. And everything fights against us on account of the sin of man. That curse remains in effect until the return of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. What's the evidence that that curse is still in effect? Everything and everybody still dies, right? Is your car rusting out like mine is? The world is still cursed. Are your parents dying? Are you dying? The world is still cursed. The world is cursed, and it is metaphorically, the non-rational creation is metaphorically longing with eagerness. That longing is expressed, and it's groaning. And the groaning is compared to the groans of childbirth, which, while it is no picnic, is entirely an anticipatory kind of groaning in its nature. In childbirth, the end is always in view. It's not endless torture. It is rather anticipatory agony. Talk to new moms, and they can tell you that's what it is. They're always happy when the baby comes. And they go, okay, it was bad, but oh, this baby, awesome. So that agony ends for the whole cosmos when the sons of God are raised from the grave. It's all tied to us. That's when the curse ends. The passage goes on to say that we as believers, we groan for it too. Pick it up in verse 23. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. 
For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now just follow that. Christians groan with anticipatory agony until we are fully and finally adopted as God's sons. Namely, until our bodies are raised and changed to be like Jesus' own body. 2 Corinthians 5 says, In this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. That's what we hope for. That's what we do not see, but are sure of. See, if we saw it, it wouldn't be hope. If we saw it, it wouldn't be by faith. But it is by faith, and we do hope in it. And since we're sure, we can afford to be patient about it. Like a pregnant mother is patient about the process leading to birth, even though it hurts. So am I saying you have agony or that you have rejoicing? Am I saying that you have agony or that you wait with patience? Well, the Bible is saying both. It is painful, but what is coming out weighs the pain. We groan for its arrival, but we are eager and patient because we are sure it is coming. Those are not contradictory ideas. They are complementary ideas. Now, I want you to know, though this will make some of you uncomfortable, that what I'm talking about, this anticipatory agony, this groaning and waiting for the resurrection of the dead, also applies to all the dearly departed believers in Christ, from Father Abraham to Paulette to the recently departed Tilza. What is their condition today? They are waiting like we are. They are presently righteous spirits. They presently exist as disembodied spirits who are with the Lord. When the Hebrew writer describes our worship under the new covenant and contrasts it with the worship of Israel, talks about rather than coming to the mountain and the fire and the smoke, that we come to the heavenly Jerusalem along with the angels and along with the whole church of the firstborn. That's all the people that belong to Jesus. And he calls them the spirits of the righteous made perfect. The dead in Christ are the spirits, the disembodied spirits, of the righteous made perfect. Perfect in the same sense that all those who are in Christ by faith are already accepted by God as perfect. The Hebrews 10 sense of Christ having made us perfect for all time by his one sacrifice. But they remain spirits with no bodies. Their bodies are still under the curse. Their bodies are still subject to the corruption of the curse. And we know where they're buried. They are disembodied on account of the curse. Now, make no mistake, they are with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5 makes it plain. Paul talks about he would rather be what he calls absent from the body. That's what we're talking about. Absent from your body and present with the Lord. And he advises us in another place that that is very much better. So they are with the Lord in their spirits. And that is very much better. But they are not yet glorified. When Romans chapter 8 goes on, we won't read it, to give us the scope of redemption down at the bottom, verses 29 and 30. The whole process of redemption, it gives us a logical order of operations. Not time, but logic. 
And it, it says that glorification is the last step. The, the, the order of operations is God foreknows us, and then he predestines us to be like Jesus, and we're called, and we're justified, and finally we're glorified. And all those things are true at all times, but they're not all possessed until it is time. So you are foreknown from the foundation of the world, but you're not called until you're called by the gospel, and you're justified at the moment of faith, but you're not glorified until you're raised by Jesus. And neither are they glorified until they're raised by Jesus. It's because their bodies are not yet redeemed. That's that Romans 8, 23. So our dear departed ones are not yet in possession of their redeemed bodies, just like us. Glorification, you need to understand, is not a personal phenomenon. It doesn't happen to us one at a time when we die. It happens all at once when we all rise. So our dear departed ones are happy in the presence of the Lord, but they still groan for the redemption of their bodies like we do. They still groan and they wait for it eagerly with patience. They're not battling sin the way we are, but they are not more glorified than we are either. I think there's a lot of confused talk about the dead in Christ, and I think we should do better. I think we can do better. The, the Christian dead do not see Jesus face to face. They don't have bodies. They do not walk the streets of gold. They don't have bodies. And the new Jerusalem has not come down out of heaven. They certainly do not have angel wings to fly around with. They never will be angels. And I don't have a clue about the new bodies, but I know Jesus never displayed any wings. To depart and be with the Lord is very much better, the Bible says. But our hope and our goal, dear ones, is not to die and go to be with the Lord. Our hope is to rise and be with the Lord. And that's better. Our longing is not to make it through this life to the grave. It is to get through this life and make it to the resurrection. That's our hope. That's our hope. Now, confusion on our part about the state of those who are dead in Christ. May, maybe it's just our grief talking. Maybe it's not bad teaching. Maybe we just have trouble handling the thought that the dear departed ones could be in any state other than protection. But I want you to know we don't need inventions to handle our grief. The Bible has a different and a much more explicit remedy for grief concerning the dead in Christ. And it's called resurrection. Amen. The, the first Thessalonians chapter 4 says the dead in Christ will rise first. And you should comfort one another with these words. So there it is. Well, believers persist in, in our current condition, waiting for the new creation of Revelation 21 and 22. We're still thirsting for the river of life in the final sense. We're still saying amen to Christ's soon return, which is a way of saying, yes, hurry. And we still long to see Christ's face. 1 John 3 See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is, and everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. That is what we hope for. We shall see him as he is when we become as he is. And since all of that is true, brothers and sisters, what does that press on us to do? There is an imperative to all this, the imperative of hope, and that is pursuing future glory. That includes, on the front end, the hopeful pursuit of holiness. And by that, I mean, in the first part, you should go after it. The verse we just read said, anybody who has the hope 
of Christ-like perfection in purity begins working at his own purity right now, longing for that day. That's plain and simple. Now, I happen to know that verse slaps some of you in the head. So I just want to pause for you to regain your composure. Some of you are not even thinking about your purity. Your progress in sanctification is not even on your mind, let alone on your agenda. Let alone at the top of the list of your agenda. So I wonder, for some of you, do you simply not think that the hope of Christ's likeness is part of being a justified Christian? And, and if, if that's true, then you've misunderstood salvation. You've misunderstood what your justification means. Or is it that you do think you're destined for Christ's likeness, but you don't think this requires any sort of effort from you? No kind of working with God's work, no kind of purposefulness on your part. And I just want to say to you, if that's you, then you've misunderstood salvation, and you've misunderstood what your sanctification means. You ought to listen to your Bible better than that and think more clearly than that. Just because God promises to do it, it doesn't mean he doesn't hold you responsible to work out your faith in his promise. Just because God promises to do it, it doesn't mean his promise cannot necessitate a certain life of faith from you. Just because God promises to do it, it doesn't mean his promises remove the exertion of your faith from the process. You have to read Hebrews 11 again, the parts we didn't read, and listen to what all those people did by faith. All of that was them pursuing the promise of God by faith alone while they were assured of it. That was them purifying themselves because they had that hope. And, and I want to say to you that the imperative includes rejoicing when it's hard, and that this is not pretending to rejoice. We read it already. We rejoice in our sufferings. That was read in our, call, in our scripture reading. We rejoice in our sufferings. And why does he say that? Because he's, we see the chain of events that are outlined there when we rejoice in our sufferings. Let me read it again. Knowing that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame or disappoint. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So the suffering will inevitably produce endurance for the believer in Christ because God is the one preserving the believer in Christ and making him endure. And that endurance will prove his character as a person of faith, as belonging to God, as someone who's being made like Christ. He's the model of perseverance under suffering. And that proof of character produces more of the very hope that we speak of, the kind that never disappoints. Because the person that sees that proof of character is seeing God make him like Jesus, and so he rejoices that God will finally make him just like Jesus. And this imperative also goes to the way we hold our hope. Romans 8, again, haven't turned anywhere new, really. He says in verse 23, We ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly await for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And I want to say to you, this is groaning, not grumbling. The passage says that present hardship is not worth comparing to future glory. And it says that the groaning that is done under suffering and hardship is eager. It's not desperate, it's eager. Desperate groaning, despairing, in other words, when I say desperate, full of despair, that's just grumbling. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 to 13, I won't take the time to turn there. That whole passage compares us in our pilgrimage to Israel in her quest to the promised land. And it says to us, we shouldn't put Christ to the test the, the way a lot of them did through their doubt and their unbelief of God's goodness and their faithlessness. And he says specifically in that passage in verse 10, nor grumble as some of them did. So we learn from this passage and others that grumbling is a sign of unbelief. Rather than do that, we must lay hold of this truth while we groan. And here's an encouragement for laying hold of it. It's it's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And that's the alternative to grumbling. You see, all of this life is a temptation not to believe and not to persevere in holy faith. But rather than grumble about how hard the temptation not to believe is and how painful the process is, You ought to believe that every single temptation that you undergo, not to believe, not to persevere, is familiar to Jesus because it's common to man. It's planned for by God. He's in charge of it. And it contains a sure way for you to escape sin and endure in holiness by faith. Anxious longing and eager waiting Lead to repentance. Grumbling just leads to sin. We anxiously long, so we seek the way out of temptation, and we keep believing. It's painful, but it's eager longing that we have. And finally, I would say that the imperative includes having our minds filled with hope. Colossians 3, 1 to 3 is familiar Set your mind on the things above. If you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. That's where you are seated spiritually along with all the saints. Departed and otherwise. That's where you're headed bodily in the resurrection. That's where your hope lies. Jesus will come for you, you will see his face, and you will share his glory, dear brother, sister. It is all too easy to be consumed with the things of this world which is passing away rather than with the world which is coming to pass. You are ramping up for that world. Your resurrection world is coming. And you need to have your mind on that instead of all of this. Now, I know that the circumstances, some of them, of your life, are pretty miserable. Some of them seem pretty hopeless, don't they? And if those things never could change then I would agree with you that you're justified in feeling trapped and discouraged and hopeless. But I want you to understand that the hope of glory we're talking about means that finally all of your circumstances are going to change. They all are. They will all change in glory. Every inglorious thing, every troubling thing, every wrong thing, will give way to the eternal right of God. It will all give way to the trouble-free glory of God in Christ through the new creation. Some of your troubles will change in this life through hardship and get better, but some of them won't. And some will, in fact, get worse. But they all get better when Jesus raises you from the dead. All the troubles, the Bible says, are excluded from the city gates in the new Jerusalem. All the sin, all the despair, all the pain, all the tears, they're all done away. 
when Jesus raises us from the dead. So my dear ones, the hope of the church, the hope of the glory of God is much bigger than you know. It's more powerful than you have realized. This hope can govern your outlook. It can guide your steps. It can steady your nerves. It can calm your fears. If you will live in it, I pray God increases our hope by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and that we may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God together. Let us pray. Father in heaven, what a hope. What glory. Never seen. Not touched by us. Oh God, bring our hope in. Bring Jesus to us. Send back your son. Who is to us the resurrection. The one who said to us, I am the resurrection. Send Jesus for us. Raise us from the dead. And usher in the new creation. We pray, come Lord Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.